um, working with families that live in New York City and um, similar to um, really nationwide, most uh, the highest um, rates of incarceration are in cities, urban centers we know, uh, yet most of the prison beds are very far away in rural communities. So in New York State, um, they're as far as uh, the Canadian border, as you can see. Um, but really, I actually want to end by going back, quick reverse, to um, this map um, of Eastern Kentucky. And um, this is actually a really critical moment right now um, on this issue because um, for over a decade now, uh, local leaders in Letcher County have been working with Congressman Hal Rogers to try to bring yet another federal prison to Eastern Kentucky. And um, the Bureau of Prisons just completed their final environmental review process, um, uh, which closed on October 29th. And um, there could be a record of decision made about this facility um, as in the um, budget on December, the federal budget on December 8th. And so there could actually be a decision made on this facility um, in, the, in the coming weeks. Um, and uh, it would be pretty stunning if they decide to go forward with this proposal. There's, there's a declining population within the federal prison system, and um, to build this many more beds at this moment in time is um, really looking backwards rather than forwards. And I think we really need to question the terms in which these prisons are being targeted specifically to communities here in West Virginia and Kentucky um, as a jobs program, as a way to restore the coal economy and be um, a, quote, recession-proof industry. Um, if you look in eastern Kentucky at the three federal prisons that were built there, um, there was one built in Clay County in 1990, one that opened in McCurry County in 2004, and one that opened in uh, Martin County in 2005. And these remain among the poorest counties um, in the nation. And when you ask people, um, did, did people actually get those jobs? Um, I've interviewed local judge executives and um, newspaper officials, and the resounding answer is, you know, they told us that this was going to be 350 jobs, and I think maybe we have 10 local people that work at those prisons. And what happens, especially in the federal system, is um, federal jobs are the hardest to get, and it's sort of like the military, where people um, end up transferring to facilities from far away, and then um, they don't, they, they commute really long distances to work. So people will commute from Prestonsburg, from Lexington, and prisons don't make local contracts with local businessmen. Um, and what often happens is counties end up paying a lot of the upfront cost to improve the road system, to improve the water system, and then really don't get the economic returns that they're promised. Um, so I think we really actually, it's an important time to be having this conversation here in our communities to think about what um, mass incarceration means also for communities that host prisons. Um, and even if you look beyond federal prisons to state prisons and private prisons, there are huge costs of what that job means for people in the community. Um, there have been studies that have shown dramatically higher rates of drug abuse, of divorce rates, of domestic abuse um, from people that work in prisons that uh, have incredibly stressful jobs and um, suffer from that work because of it. And so I think it's really an important conversation to be having in our region of what this means for our communities. And I wanted to invite my good friend Raymond to join me now, um, who took the beautiful photographs that you saw um, and I was so lucky to have Raymond be a part of this trip because um, he, he's also doing incredible work on this issue. And what's amazing is sort of our work sort of, um, I don't know, it was like these two streams that ran together because his project is a part of a much larger um, long-form investigation into this issue as well. And so um, Raymond, I wanted to ask you a little bit about how the photos you trip, took on our van trip sort of fit into your larger project on this issue. And I will oh. fast forward for you. So for the longest time, I've been trying to document the impact of uh, mass incarceration on family and communities. So really paying attention to 
its impact on children and women specifically. So this was like one of the perfect ways to sort of show like when you when people are being incarcerated from the urban areas and the prisons are way out in rural areas, that divide, like how separated they can be. Um, so that sort of fell into one of the areas in which I was interested in covering. Um, but I'm going to back up and I'm going to kind of go from the beginning a little bit and I'll try to keep it short. Um, I was also an American Studies major, like Sylvia, um, and I took a prison industrial complex class way back when and I discovered the, the huge issue that this was and, and how much it impacted um, people of color. Um, and from there, I, as soon as I got to graduate school, um, one of the largest stories I wanted to do was to sort of look at, like, you know, one question I wanted to ask was, like, what is the impact of war on drugs on the community level? Um, in order to do that, I um, found this uh, great resource called the Justice, the Justice Mapping Project. And from there, they had statistics that would kind of um, narrowed down to community level, like prison expenditures, like how much money is being spent to incarcerate people from um, various communities based on zip codes. So I was able to um, pinpoint, specifically that was in Austin, Texas at the time, so I found um, a specific neighborhood in Austin, Texas, and I was able to look at, I know the government is spending $50 million to incarcerate people from this one zip code. Um, so my question then became, so what does this place look like? How are people in this community being impacted? Um, and this photograph is a photograph of Beverly Brown. And her family is really interesting because in her family you're able to see three, gener three basically three generations in their family were incarcerated. You're able to be able to see when it started, right around the time in the beginning of the war on drugs in the 1980s with um, um, her, her brothers and then the same thing happened to her children and then the same thing happened to her grandchildren. And I was able to sort of map it out and tell that story. Um, move on and then from there um, I also wanted to but I didn't want to just you know tell a sad story of all these people who are incarcerated I wanted to try to find nonprofits or people who are doing things about this issue um, so I then spent the pretty much the rest of the project trying to find nonprofits that were working to help um, people who are being impacted um, the first one was the um, African-American Harvest Foundation which is located in Austin Texas um, basically, the organization works, um, children who somehow get um, caught up with the, um, I guess now they get tickets for kids who get in trouble in school, they'll give you a ticket and they'll send you to court. Um, not this particular kid, but there's one story where a kid had spit off the balcony and he was given a ticket and sent, he was sent in front of a judge, and the judge sent him to this organization. Um, but they, they did really wonderful work, um, little basic things like teaching basic skills, and this young man had just learned how to tie a tie, and then they went to do some other sort of math homework. Um, there are also um, women involved in this organization, young ladies who, and they're also the organization that's inspiring them to be entrepreneurs. Um, and one of the ways I wanted to show, it, you know, people or organizations fighting for agency was to show they're you know, inspiring people. This young lady wanted to start a, a, like a fashion business, and she's using you know, any the, any resources she could to sort of create space. Um, you know, this is like a, a like a little one of those. Um, you can buy them from Walmart. You know, the closet thing. And then she's like set up in our studio back there. Um, this is also in the same zip code that Beverly was in, um, so I pretty much focused on that one zip code in Austin, Texas. This is just another image of her on the train track. Um, her dad had been incarcerated for many years, and so she never really has known her father. So, you know, just trying to find other ways in which to show the impact of incarceration just on the children in the community. Also, um, documented. Um, this is the, an aftermath of a police shooting. It was a protest in Austin, Texas, um, of a man who was uh, shot by, by one of the swing from the police officers. Another organization I worked with, worked with was the um, Princey Family of Louisiana's Incarcerated Children. Um, this is in a juvenile justice facility in New Orleans. And this organization primarily worked to help um, provide resources to parents who had children who have been or who are currently incarcerated. So I was able, I mean, I got access to go inside and I couldn't forget the interfaces. Um, 
So I got access to them when they're out playing basketball um, on a basketball court that's surrounded by a, a tall high. I'm not as intense as some prison fences, but still is there in the prison playing basketball. Um, this is inside one of their um, cells. Um, if you notice the graffiti, um, it's, there are lots of childish graffiti on that wall. It's a very kind of powerful, I can't imagine a child being confined to that space and what that might do to them. Um, which um, along the line it brought me to closer to this area. Um, this is the from the nonprofit Hope House, um, who work to sort of reconnect children with their incarcerated parents. Um, this is in Cumberland, Maryland. Um, this young man, um, at the end of their day, would bring kids in from mostly from outside Washington D.C. Um, to visit their fathers. Um, most of these kids haven't seen their dads in several years. Um, at the very last day of the camp, they have this like you know, this dance, dance with your father. I think they were playing that Luther Vandross song, Dance with Your Father, doing this, doing this image, on the image to make. And from there, I pivoted to working on a nonprofit called um, Friends and Family of Incarcerated People outside of Washington, D.C. Um, and there, they were working again with, they work with children who had incarcerated parents um, to try to provide some sort of support system. Um, this is on a, a camping trip. Uh, which many of the kids had never been camping before, um, taken out into uh, rural Virginia, and just to sort of get them away from the city so they can stop and be able to think about, you know, what it is they want for themselves. You know, they also did um, know your rights sessions in which they um, tried to address like how the children should interact with police. Um, one of the more interesting stories I heard was, you know, stories about children, their first interaction with a police officer being them raiding their house. Um, with guns drawn, looking for someone else, which is one of the more touching um, stories that I came across. This is another image from that camp. The same organization in the uh, community car wash. Oh, this is all in Anacostia, in Washington, D.C., this picture specifically. And that led me, as I was looking for more individual stories to tell, me and Sylvia met. And I went along on the, the bus trip to document um, what it was like for women to travel and, and family um, to travel so far to visit their loved ones. Cool. So that. Yeah. Um, well, we'd love to open it up to you if you have any reflections, questions for either of us about this project, this issue. Um, yeah. Send them your way, or I'll, or I'll keep asking Raymond questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do the friends and family of the incarcerated people and calls from home still to like coordinate together now, or is it just you two that kind of? So where was that organization? Um, that the Friends and Family Incarcerated People are based in Washington, D.C. Um, so no, there's no connection between the two, between mm -hmm. us. Um, that was, I, but there is a weird connection. Um, the guy who started that store um, was incarcerated at this prison um, for a number of years. Oh, wow. There's a lot of people um, from D.C. that are sent to Red Onion. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I think there needs to be um, more of that kind of urban-rural cooperation. As much as, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When we were talking with the people on the bus, um, had you known them a little bit, or I guess talking to them before? They knew me through the radio show. Um, they'd been calling WMT for years at that point. So it was, um, the trips were pretty meaningful for me personally just because. Um, you know, I had, we had sort of been voices on the other end of the phone for years and years, and so we knew each other, um, but we had never met in person before. So we sort of, we met up at 11 o'clock at the Greyhound bus station, and they were like, oh my god, you're Sly Rye, which is my DJ name, and I was like, yeah, you're Michelle. So, yeah, it was really neat to kind of, you know, take this thing that had been very remote, just call, through calling, and make it actually like people working together. Yeah. Actually, if we have a little extra time, I can play um, a short video um, of sort of the Calls From Home show in action. Um, give me one second. If anybody has another question, I'll pull this up. 
Yeah. So I have a quick question. Just sort of thinking about that, how uh, the prison system is obviously not just for prisons, but also for the new Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. Have either of you had much experience dealing with recently released offenders and programs related to, to that experience at all? To re-entry? Yeah. Challenges to re-entry? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm actually doing a lot of work around that in New York State, specifically around the important, I mean, very similar to um, what Calls From Home is trying to do, which is to support family connectivity. And um, so right now I'm doing some work with a nonprofit called the Osborne Association that um, does a lot of work supporting incarcerated parents and in ways to stay in touch with their children. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, I think reentry is is just an enormous, huge piece of this puzzle um, that there's so much work to be done. And I think um, the work that I'm doing mostly relates to um, to families and how they stay connected because um, families are the reentry program of first and last resort. Um, if we don't provide other services, other support things, this is who people are coming back to. And so if you isolate people and cut off their communication with their family during their entire incarceration, what options are we leaving for people to come home to if you um, don't still have those relationships? So I think that supporting family connectivity during incarceration is absolutely key to any kind of successful reentry. Um, and then we need to remove the countless other obstacles that people face. Yeah. Do, I, do you guys want to see a little bit of the Calls From Home show? <laughs> this, is, um, this is in the studio. It's very short. It's like five minutes, and then um, we'll take more questions. Plug it in. Oh, that's a good idea. Good evening, you all. You're listening to Hot 87 Hip Hop from the Hilltop. This is DJ Jules, and upstairs we have DJ Sly Ride taking calls from 7 to 9 p.m. Justice to the judges like a solo dad's brother. Picture me falling. Leonardo's last supper now. I was the DJ of the Hotter the Hood Calls from Home show for eight years, and one night we got a call from a woman whose brother was incarcerated at Red Onion, and she just asked, would it be possible for her to go on the air and, and send a message out to him directly? I said, yes, absolutely, that would be amazing. Hi, welcome to Calls From Home, this is Sylvia. Would you like to leave a message tonight? Okay, great, and you've called here before, right? Calls from Home is a weekly radio show that sends messages and shout outs to people incarcerated in the prison system in central Appalachia. Hi ma'am, are you still there? To me, I mean, this show is reaching an audience that we have here in the mountains that needs to be served to make it possible for families to communicate even though they are separated by massive distances. Where are you calling tonight? I'm calling from um, Illinois. Uh huh. And um, my husband, he's actually in the federal penitentiary in Kentucky. It's this devastating position to be in because you feel the sort of awkwardness of it being this one-sided phone conversation where I know that um, the reason it's this awkward one-sided conversation is because I'm, a, I'm the wrong person on the other side of the phone. It shouldn't be me. It should be whoever they're calling. Hey, man. I'm just... I'm just overwhelmed right now, man. I miss you, big dog. Keep your head up, man. All that. Love you, man. Hi, this is a shout out to Michael Dennis Austin at Red Onion State Prison. This is your mom. I'm calling to let you know that you're a new uncle of Lem Dennis Mitchell Austin. You're the man that touches my heart. You're there to always listen and reassure me and protect me. And you're my love and my best friend. I mean, of course, the calls that are always the hardest are the kids calling in. Um, that I had a, a little girl call in and um, sing her dad the ABCs on the radio show because she just learned them and she wanted him to know that she could sing them. Hearing the voice of someone's five-year-old calling to tell them good night really alters whatever you've been told about who is locked up. Hi, Uncle Frankie. Uh, I really miss you. This is Sarah, hearing me. I just want you 
out of prison and I want to see you. I mean, I, I don't even really know you. All I can do is just hear you on the phone or something. I don't know what to say. I would like to give a shout out to my pops, Yaya. We got four days of school left. Looking forward to this. All my grades is up. But we love and miss you. Can't wait to see you. I mean, I need to see you in person because I ain't seen you in person yet. But, hold on. Hey, Alexiana, real quick. I can't wait until I be a grown up so you can come see me every day. And I love you. Often the show is, is mostly, um, you know, family members calling in to give updates on their lives and say hello and um, provide hope and inspiration. And, um, but woven throughout that is also the political work um, being done against mass incarceration. Peace, brother. It's Matt, your comrade, brother, and friend. As always, I send my love and respect to all of you who are currently forced to endure the inhumane living conditions that Red Onion and Wallace Ridge State Prison as a previous captive of these two human warehouses and a victim of much of the abusive practices taking place there. I totally understand the intensity of the repression each of you are forced to live with on a daily basis. When it comes from the oppressed, when it comes from those in these dungeons that the United States had placed in such way out locations that they are really off everyone's radar. And yet prisoners, these human beings, find ways to raise their voices to say, hey, we can do better than this. Reach out to us. To me, the real work of this show and what makes it the success that it is, is the organizing that happens um, done by the people inside prison that share the phone number to the radio show, that uh, write home and tell people when to call in. They're the ones that are doing the work that makes this show happen. To me, so much of the beauty of this show is how simple the technology is that makes it happen. Any station that has a prison within its signal radius could, could make a show like ours. Yeah, well, thanks for calling in, and we're here every week, so uh, keep calling. You ready to go? That's a little behind the look, scenes look at how it all happens. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Sylvia, does that show continue now? Yeah. Yeah, you can tune in. It's um, you can stream it. Well, I mean, it it's it's broadcast. It's a public radio station, but um, you can also stream it online. Um, if you go to wmt.org every Monday night at nine o'clock, um, the calls are going out. Yeah, and every call, um, to me, what's really remarkable about it is um, it's it's really quick turnaround. So. We basically, it, one of the values of the show is if you, if you call in that night, your call won't go on air that same night because people really use it as basic communication. So if you're saying, you know, someone's in the hospital, a baby's been born, that it really needs to be a really timely turnaround. Um, so it's like that. Yeah. And one of the things I just wanted to add is I think that... Um, you know, I, I was a reporter in Letcher County for five years, and I really covered, um, you know, I was doing work with the call show, working with families, but I also was covering this issue um, and all of the, um, uh, you know, things that were unfolding with the planning commission that was working to bring the prison. And something that I think was always very striking to me was when um, local officials talked about bringing this prison to town and the jobs it would bring. and. Um, you know, the experience of these family members was never a part of the conversation of what it would mean to build another federal prison there. And I really think we need to bring that into the conversation that if this prison goes forward, it will be built in a county that has no public transportation access, that is extremely remote, and that will mean thousands of families that will uh, be almost impossible for them to get there. And. I also think that West Virginia specifically is um, really um, central in this issue, both because there are so many prisons here, um, and I just learned last night that West Virginia actually has one of the highest rates of incarceration for women in the country. It's West Virginia and Oklahoma. And so I think um, we... And yet at the same time, prisons are being promoted to our communities as a jobs program. And so I think we really need to question that and also um, what are ways that we can support families being able to see their loved ones um, 
and, and what are the things that you know our communities can do to help um, make travel and connection more possible and like you said what to how to help people when they come out yeah any other questions yeah in terms of the prison industrial complex how many of those 16 prisons uh, on the map are private versus state or federal and i'm guessing mm -hmm. that a lot of that's an excellent question, and the answer is the opposite. That of those 16, um, only one of them was private, and it actually closed. Um, and I think that's actually a common misperception, is that most of this prison growth is private prisons. Um, actually, nationally, only 8% of prisons are, are private, 92% are public. And I think what's interesting about that is the line between public and private is actually far more blurry in that even though they're federal and state prisons, they have private phone contracts, private food contracts, everything. So even within the public system, it's, it's really privatized. You know, I mean, the phone companies is a whole issue into itself. Um, and so, but it really is, um, you know, it's a federal and state construction and governments that are deciding to do this. Yeah. There was a uh, documentary about 10 years ago titled Up the Ridge. Was mm -hmm. that not Wall and the Ridge? It was, yeah. That's an, app, that's an Apple Shop documentary. And Amelia, actually, who you saw, was um, one of the filmmakers on that film. But Wallens Ridge is, is a state, Virginia State prison. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great question. Um, so at Red Onion and Walden's Ridge, they can buy, um, it's called an MP4 player. Um, they can buy from the prison commissary um, that you, yeah, you can tune into like, like local radio frequencies from this little MP4 player and listen on your headphones. Um, but actually some men have told us that if they can't afford um, the MP4 player that that actually people will sort of share the radio through the vent system that connects different cells. So you can hold it up to like your cell vent and then everybody in your um, vent system can hear the show. Yeah. But I think it's, I mean, it's pretty, I mean, radio is pretty special in that way that it's sort of, if, I mean, prisons are the most censored institution in our country and yet radio is basically the only media that people incarcerated have unrestricted access to. Um, that, you know, if, if we broadcast it, they can tune into the station and, and hear it. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. So, this is kind of uh, off topic of, of your work and a little bit more philosophical, but I, I know that um, the, the name of one of your uh, projects is Mm -hmm. And I think we have a, mm. a very um, specific idea of what justice means in mm -hmm. this country and um, that word restorative to be, yeah. you know, calls out a, new, a different kind of justice we don't talk about much in this country. And I just wonder if you uh, have some thoughts you want to share about our system of justice and yeah. uh, how that's different than maybe what restorative justice is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Raymond can talk to this too. I'm so glad you picked up on that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, ha has anyone heard of this term restorative justice? Um, I mean, to me, it's a really exciting thing. Um, I think, you know, when you talk about the prison system, people often feel like, okay, this is, this is not good, but what do we do? Um, and, but I think we, we live in a very punitive society that, um, uh, our system is, all, is about punishment. Um, and what res restorative justice, the philosophy of it, is, is sort of an approach to um, the philosophy of harm reduction. So um, how do you, if someone commits a crime, there's been harm done to a community, so how do we then uh, restore the harm that has been done? Um, and I mean, it's a, it's a whole field into itself, but I think, um, that, you know, 
especially when you think about you know looking at families' experience of the system, how how much greater harm we're causing by sending people away, um, and that there are really different ways we can approach justice that are still holding people accountable, um, but are actually working to restore a community um, rather than sort of perpetuate um, a lot of the issues that we see in our society. Um, Raymond, do you have anything to add on restorative justice? I mean, I feel like restorative justice will be you know, the perfect, we, we reach a point where it's not about incarcerating people yeah. of color. Um, for various reasons, I think we can come to a point to where we mm. want to heal communities rather than tear them apart.